Well, good morning, everyone. I thought I'd go neutral and not have any color on, but I will point out that you're sitting in blue seats, seated on a blue carpet. Uh, <laughs> we have had so much fun. Started last weekend, if you weren't with us for Easter, we started what we call Color Clash, and we're, uh, we're broken into teams. You should have got cards. If you didn't get uh, cards, make sure you get some on the way out. And, and the whole thing is that we're really just having a blast, and uh, we're trying to invite new people to church through this activity, and so I hope you will participate with us. This next three weeks, we're having a conversation about a very provocative uh, uh, statement. A Christian atheist. Sounds like an oxymoron. And because th that, what it means is we follow God, but don't believe in God. That's the literal translation of it. But, but what it also might mean something is that we're missing something. Or that the way we are responding is missing the mark. Now, next week, as we continue this conversation about Christian atheists, we'll talk about fearing God. And the third week, we'll talk about trusting God. But today, we want to talk about the basics. Do we really know God? Do we understand and believe what it meant when Jesus rose from the dead? Or, are, like Thomas, are we questioning that journey? Well, today we want to have a conversation about knowing God. Let's pray. Lord God, as we came in today and listened to this music and just the beautiful blend of our, our servants of music and uh, the instruments and the voices and how they blend together, we can feel your presence in this place. And yet there are times where we're far from that and... What we need from you, Lord, is uh, a, a closer relationship. And today, as we talk, may that become apparent. May your words uh, from Scripture and your life be an example to all of us as we share together and what it means to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I think one of the biggest problems is that many of us accept God from others. We understand we get our lessons from God from someone that taught us. And it's, it's really not unusual because if you think about it, if you grew up in the church, that's the way it started. You came in uh, to Sunday school and someone talked to you about God. Somebody uh, told you what God was about each Sunday. And, and, kinda, and for that matter, at least when I was growing Growing up, we got the good stuff. We never got the bad stuff. And it was all this, and so there was one-sided conversation. And so we were brought up in this manner of, of being told who God is without having uh, any other background behind that. And so uh, I, I think it's kind of like this. Last weekend, my mother-in-law had me watching Chip and Joanna Gaines on Fixer Upper. Now, what happens is, is we watch sports TV, and if we happen to fall asleep, sleep uh, in the nice chairs that they have at their house and the temperature at 80 degrees, uh, it, it gets switched to HGTV. I think that's where they're at anyhow. Now, I know some of you are probably horrified that I don't know Chip and Joanna better, but uh, that I sure understand that they're popular. Big deal. A anyhow, this couple was moving back to the United States and they were having Chip and Joanna Gaines fix up their house. But the remarkable thing about the story was that this couple had been out abroad and they bought a house online. They didn't, uh, sight unseen, they bought a house. Uh, they, uh, and so they paid $155,000 from far away and they were showing up. And Chip and Joanna were with them when they first saw their house. And it was quite interesting to see their response and they said so was it what you expected and the couple was kind of like not exactly and then the great camera shots of fixer upper you know they're showing some rotted wood over here and you know like the door the door of the house was like over here instead of right smack in the center it wasn't exactly what they expected and that's what some Christians including myself for a lot of my life are like we grew up being told who Jesus was 
and, and to be do to, and to be good Christians to do this, 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 and this, or believe this, 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 and this, but never a conversation about relationship. And so we went through life without ever knowing God personally. Oh, sure, there were those special moments along the way. We had a baptism this morning, and, and Harrison was baptized, and it was just a heavenly moment. It was beautiful, and, and so those are one of those moments. And I think that's because God is always trying to woo us into a relationship. God is always, that provenient grace is always there drawing us in. It's what God wants to do, and so those moments are there, but we don't. The fact is that he sent Jesus for this very purpose, for the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. God, Jesus came that we would know God. But for many of us, there was never a relationship. Now, that's not on God, that's on us. Now, like the prodigal son story. You know that story when the prodigal son has gone away and he's come back. And at the close of that story, when the son is coming back, it, it reminds us of how God is with us. It said, while he was, the son was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And, and I think that's what it is with God. I think God wants to have that kind of relationship with us. Not the one that we learned in sections and pieces along the way, but an actual relationship that God can just, when he knows we're far off and he's waiting for us and he's waiting for us and as soon as we get close, as soon as we start to come towards God, God comes running up to us and hugs us and kisses us. He says, I want that. That's what I believe God wants from us. And it takes relationship to know God. Amen? It takes relationship. Without a relationship, we're playing the part of Christians. But we're not true followers. We are what Craig Groeschel calls cultural Christians. We go to church. But there's no evidence of our faith and there is no obedience to God's command. In 1 John chapter 2, it says, Whoever says, I have come to know him, but does not obey his commandments, is a liar. And in such a person, the truth does not exist. Hmm. That hurts. What the world is rejecting is this type of Christian. Because it's not sincere. It's just a cultural thing. Amen? I love the fact that we're talking, a lot of people are talking today in churches and saying that, you know, that the, some churches are bending to the way of culture. You know what I think? I think that if we don't do and reach out in culture, we're bending to the way of culture. I think that what it, we need to be people who believe in what God is calling us to, to, to accept people. The truth is we are bending to culture when we don't accept people. Amen? Amen? It is our actions, not our reactions, that define us as Christians. So, I got a question. What do people see when they look at us? John 13, 35 says, By this that everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. We love people. Amen? That's what we're called to do. And, and, and I hear a lot about our church. I hear things about all the things we do wrong, much more than the things we do right. On the streets here in Port Orange, the word is that First Church is in turmoil. I think First Church is exactly where it should be. I think First Church is actively out loving people. We, what are the fruits of our ministry? That says who we are. The world will know when we know God. They'll know if we're faking it. And, just, and not just know about God, but know God. When people see us getting involved, stepping out in faith, giving of what we have, then they will know we are Christians, not Christian atheists. Matthew 7.21, beginning at 7.21, says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only one who does the will of my Father in heaven. 
And this is important. Listen to this next verse. There are consequences about being partly Christian. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. <laughs> Believing but not being full in with God gets us nowhere. Get that? Gets us nowhere. Galatians 4 says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by the nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning your back on those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? It's saying that we turn back because we're not living out a life. We know this relationship with God. But we set it up on the shelf sometimes. That hurts me. It hurts me because there are times and places that something else takes over in me. Anybody else have this problem? <laughs> when somebody hurts me or threatens my family. When somebody cuts me off in traffic. When I feel there is a justice issue, which is everybody else on the road but me. Or in particular, you've heard me say it before, when I'm at a soccer game. <laughs> I'm working on this, but it is when I let my base instincts take over, take hold of me. And I'm not aware of the face of God in those moments. I have to be honest. I'm not aware. I know I'm getting better at it, and I know I'm getting better because God is there, even in those places. God even woos me when I'm being such a jerk. And I can tell you there are many referees in soccer that know that about me. <laughs> I'm slowly getting there. Slowly getting to know God even in those places. Because he's still see God is still seeking me. I have to believe this about God. I believe that God who conquered death to be near me and you cannot be silenced by our missteps. Praise the Lord. Amen. Here's the really good news. When we do get it, when we do know God, there is power in knowing God. James 2.19 kind of has this uh, snarky same saying. It says, you believe in God, that God is, you believe that God is one. Well, you do well. Even the demons believe. And then it says, and shudder. <laughs> this is kind of a slap in the face because you believe good for you. But even the believe, demons believe in him. Then it says my favorite part, and they shudder. You see, God has power over that evil force that we're so afraid of. God has power over that. And if we let God take control of our lives, there is power in us. Power to do his will. Acts 4 gives a perfect example of this. First we hear from that first church how they lived. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions but everything they owned was held in common. And then we hear the results when that happens. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace, not just grace, but great grace was upon them all. Well, they were super gifted. The literal translation would be super gifted by the power of God. That's what I think God's calling us to. And this is confirmed in Ephesians 3. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to do, accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. You know, we think we can ask God for something. If God does it, then it's going to all work out. God does more than that. Amen? God takes it up a notch, always kicks it up a notch to prove that God is God. And that's, that's what happens. And God wants to share in that relationship. And wants to share God's power. Listen to this way back in 2 Chronicles in the Old Testament. It says in 2 Chronicles 16.9, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the entire earth to strengthen those whose heart is true to Him. God is looking for us. Are you following me? Are you following me? Do you believe me? Do you know me? Let me help you. If we truly know God, we long for that relationship. 
Listen to the depths of that longing in Psalm 42. The psalmist really loves God. Listen to this. As a deer longs for the flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? There's that song that you've probably heard before, as the deer, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longs for you. And you, you they actually sang that as the anthem in the uh, traditional service this morning. And, and Miguel and I were talking about, our worship leader and I were talking about that song, and he was telling me, he said, you know, at one time I really didn't like that song. I just, just didn't like the song and the way it works at all. But, but he said, I didn't get it until the words one day got a hold of him. And I told him, I said, I think that was God. You knowing God through those words and through that song. And, and that's what we do. When we get to know God, we thirst for God. There are probably some of you out here that I've said these words to you. Lay it at the feet of Jesus. If you're going through a struggle, if you're going through a wrong, a tough time, don't muscle through it on your own. Give it to God. Amen? Well, I've done that. I've done that right here in this place. And, and I've done that and I've done that in my bed at night. And, and, and but it's in those times that I'm least likely to be considered an atheist. Because I'm in this relationship with God. I'm broken and I'm hurting. But God is there. And we are buds. Amen? Here's the thing. Knowing God and seeing God aren't the same thing. We heard this passage today from Thomas, and we always call it Thomas the Doubter. And last year, I preached on Thomas the Doubter, and you might remember, I, I didn't really like that name, being the, I'm a Thomas, you know, and I don't like being called a doubter. But, but I think it's more than that. I said last year, and I still hold to this, that if you read that passage closely and pay attention to the way it's laid out, I believe Thomas got it without touching Jesus' hands. We hear that Jesus says to Thomas, he says, put your finger in my wound and put your hand in my side. And as soon as he says that, Thomas says, my Lord, my God. The scripture does not say Thomas touched his wounds and then stuck his hands and then wiped them off and washed and said, my Lord, my God. It's just simply as soon as Jesus spoke to him, he knew he encountered the risen Savior, and his relationship started. And, and I don't know that my Hebrew or my Greek that well to know if it's the right pronoun or not, but Jesus immediately turns, and in the, our scripture, in our passage, it says, he turned to him. But I, it could have just as easily been turned to everybody in the room, turned to them, and said, look, blessed are those who believe without seeing. Because I think that's what happened to Thomas right in that instance. He encountered God. And, th and that makes the difference. So knowing and seeing God aren't the same thing. But believing God and knowing God aren't the same thing either. Craig Rochelle, who wrote, that's where we get the video that we use today, and he wrote this. He said, when believing in God is as far as you go, you follow a religion. When you begin to know God, you start to live in right relationship with God. My favorite, uh, well, it's my favorite Catholic, I'm sorry, Richard Rohr <laughs> said this. He said, deep knowing and presence do not happen with our thinking minds. To truly know, to truly know something, our whole being must be open, awake, and present. And I think that's what God's calling us to do. Follow me, but be open, be awake, be present to my spirit in this place. Be open to the spirit and you're driving down the street and you see someone along the side of the road and, and then maybe they're in need or, or maybe they just need someone to beep and wave at them, say, hey, be open and awake and present to God's Spirit. John Wesley was a great man. He started the Methodist movement in the, out of the Anglican Church. And yet, 
He didn't get it for the longest time. He didn't get He knew all the scripture and he knew all the right answers and he knew everything that he'd been taught and all the things that he'd learned and he'd been preaching for a long time. Then one day, he had a relationship with God. We call that the Alders Gate experience or the Alders Gate event or Alders Gate day. He went to a church and and while he was there, he said, I knew God. I knew God loved me. Me. And that's when his relationship came, became real. And that's when his future became bright. Paul's prayer in Ephesians is what I pray for us. Ephesians 1, starting in verse 17, says this. I keep asking that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. See, that's what revelation really is. It's knowing God so that you may know him better. And then it says, beginning in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. And I pray, Tom prays for all of us, that we become fully devoted Christians who know God intimately. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.